Thank you. Thank you. And um, I'm very pleased to be involved with the virtual rejects um, at this crazy time. So, hello, I am Andy, a technical, technical milliner by this stage. You could say that I'm a, a build fanatic, an advocate of continuous everything, and a zealous acolyte of automated verification. I am a, a lifelong learner and a teacher, and I'm very proud to be an occasional course author and official trainer for SANS. Watch out for SEC 584 Defending Cloud Native dropping in probably Q3 this year. Um, I've done work with HashiCorp and Docker and control planes uh, work with our clients. That birthed the technology that we'll be talking about today. Um, at, as the intro mentioned, I'm a founder at Control Plane, SecOps for Kubernetes, focusing on regulated industries, including financial services. And we espouse continuous infrastructure and security practices with a focus on cloud native deployments, farm to table or Git to Kubernetes. And I want to talk about how we understand the cloud native threat model and how we upskill and train the next generation of cloud native security engineers and architects. So what is this talk about? Kubernetes, insecure defaults and historical CVEs, common attack vectors that can root cluster. These are fixed by adding controls and testing them to ensure that they're correctly applied. But this then requires addressing the skills gap. Architects with sufficient knowledge to devise controls are required and a red team with sufficient knowledge to exploit our clusters. So we're here to talk about how we achieve that addressing of the skills gap with attack trees, a visual representation of the security of a system gathered from across different teams to form a common understanding and Kubesim, a Kubernetes security training tool that we have open sourced. So who isn't using Kubernetes in 2020? Kubernetes has won the orchestrator wars by virtue of being all things to all men. But all of these companies have endured the same struggle to secure that orchestrator in the same way. There are two fundamental barriers to deploying Kubernetes from a security perspective. CVEs are bound in non-trivial code. As we would expect in any project of this size and velocity, security is difficult and CVEs are a fact of life. And secondly, Kubernetes is historically insecure by default. We will dig into that later. So in terms of CVEs, well, there are some redeeming features. Security releases are fast. The project has a stated goal of fixing security issues within seven days of private disclosure and releasing the version with the fixes within 21 days, which is significantly faster than, for example, Project Zero, which is Google's internal pen testing and bug hunting team for uh, external projects, which has a 90-day disclosure window. Obviously, dealing with external vendors makes that more difficult. But still, this seven-day disclosure window is probably industry-leading, especially for such a substantial project of this size and with this much contribution. Also, the security team itself is comprised of some high caliber individuals from the biggest software houses on the planet, which instilled some trust in that process from enterprise customers, clients. So vulnerabilities are just a fact of life. They occur in any fast moving project. So in order to deal with that stated fact, Clusters must be deployed with a layered set of security controls so that when something inevitably does go wrong, the blast radius, the effective range in which the security violation is relevant, the blast radius of an exploited CVE is as contained as possible, no pun intended. This is something we must do opportunistically as there's no way of saying where the next zero day will come from and we do as much testing to prevent misconfiguration as possible, but still that is a common vector of exploitation. And in terms of controls, I've mentioned that Kubernetes is insecure by default. That is to say, 
the security functionality is available, but generally not enabled. So what does enabled mean? What ships as default? Well, really, whatever your specific flavor of Kubernetes is, is whatever the distribution configures for you. But default doesn't really exist as there is no standard Kubernetes. The closest that we have is the KubeADM experience, which many distributions have now centered around for cluster bootstrap. But KubeADM is optimized for developer productivity and not security. This means that the more comprehensive suite of security functionality afforded by the control plane is not configured or enabled by default. For any new administrator, this is the start of a bad day that may be about to get worse. So, what attacks are possible on insecure clusters? Although not the core focus of this talk, here's a whole host of risks that an insecurely configured cluster is subject to. And we'll see later how we can educate and upskill teams to appraise and remediate some of these risks. Now, historically, the pace of feature delivery has outstripped security functionality. Kubernetes may not have got to the position of dominance that it enjoys today without the relentless focus on shipping features, enabling end users to deliver business value. Everything in life is a compromise, and this developer-focused path to general adoption was perhaps the right one to take for Kubernetes. This story has also become better with time, as Kubernetes has shipped a whole host of security features. These security features help to mitigate the risks that we've seen, and there are a number of good practices and tools publicly available. The challenge now facing organizations is how to cut through the noise and make sense of it all. Security teams typically do not like what they do not know, and cloud native expertise is a rarefied skill. Security architects who haven't used Kubernetes or the cloud are generally used to looking at things like this, whereas an attacker is probably looking at something like this. Attackers see things differently. They don't have access to confluence. They don't have the architecture and network topology diagrams that we are professionally responsibly forced to, to build out before we build these systems. Instead, they, they operate in graphs and enumerate. And again, we'll, we'll look at this more later. So we have a skills problem between what architects and traditional security teams know and do and what is required to secure the Kubernetes orchestrator from the modern panoply of attacks. We have a skills problem. We need to derive controls and ensure that they're enacted correctly. All of these organizations mentioned previously have had to understand the security implications of running Kubernetes and thus had to develop expertise for securely configuring and testing those clusters. We know this is a challenge. And so today we'll talk about some security modeling techniques that make it easier for an organization to decide what controls to use when implementing and securing Kubernetes. These are threat modeling and attack trees. These are processes of bringing together stakeholders within an organization from different parts of that organization and having them collaborate to think about security. These departments might be development, DevOps, QA, compliance, security, the business, project managers. They collaborate, there is a shared understanding emerging from using these processes and these threat models and attack trees then provide us with a single point of reference from which we can decide what controls to apply to a cluster. And finally, KubeSim is the open source Kubernetes simulator for demonstrating attack, defense, and remediation principles in a safe space where teams and individuals can learn and experiment with impunity. We use this as a teaching tool for understanding how to defend Kubernetes clusters. The control plane has performed a lot of work helping security departments to understand the implications of the developer-led Kubernetes migration. This is often discovered by security just before go live, 
resulting in delays, breakdowns of trust, siloed departments, and all the general things that we've seen in transformations and evolutions since the history of uh, the internet and probably indeed software. So threat modeling is a great opportunity to get all stakeholders involved at the design stage, produce these central points of reference, create this common language and understanding between teams to really build that human connection that is so vital to an efficient security function, create these resulting patterns for reuse. Once we've threat modeled one thing, something similar is then a lot easier and quicker to jumpstart as a process. And finally, apply organizationally unique contexts to commonly known threats. What does that mean? Well, if you're getting popped by SQL injection all the time, for example, um, you may want to put more efforts into your application layer. Whereas if there are a huge amount of uh, targeted supply chain attacks, you probably want to be careful about how you ingest things into your organization um, rather than uh, specifically the code that you're writing. Um, and uh, the entire spectrum of the MITRE attack framework. So what is threat modeling? Threat modeling asks everybody that has even so much as looked sideways at the system, the same set of questions. What is this thing that we're building? What is the very worst that could happen? There are no wrong answers, go wild. What do we do to prevent these apocalyptic scenarios that we're projecting? And is that enough? Did we do a good job? Let's go back to the beginning now that we have a view of the whole system and see if we missed anything. Of course, this can carry on ad infinitum, so it's important to time box, but things continue to be uh, revealed upon closer inspection because of course we're dealing with hugely complex systems with many interconnected and um, dependent moving parts. So it is important when threat modeling not to be scared by the formalized threat modeling methodologies and just get it done. Ask the questions, note the answers, rinse and repeat. Uh, Control Plane does this in a very lightweight manner. We try and avoid heavy process. We try and avoid too much front-loaded documentation and we just get a whiteboard and start scribbling away. This is really useful because everyone can contribute. And this is a process of equalization among stakeholders. Nobody's opinion is more or less equal or valid. And these stakeholders from development know where the bodies are buried. Tests know perhaps what compromises have been made to test complex parts of a microservices call graph. Maybe there have been some security questionable decisions made in order to ensure that automated testing is possible. Everything is a balance or a compromise. Maybe that is a risk that we are happy to accept. Operations know the dirty secrets of deployment and have a view on what is shipped to them by the application teams, architecture, product, the business, and anybody else who has anything to contribute. And finally, security, who know that they often don't get told any of these things. Nobody will ever volunteer this information unless we are in a safe, non-violent space, collaborating and working together, and all aiming for the ultimate conclusion, which is to generate business value in a secure and uh, uncompromisable manner, in inverted quotes, commas rather. Uh, so we have all these people together, we put them in a room, and we spread the net of potential opinion. The unexpected often rears its head as assumptions and expectations do not come true, or or in the inverse, are, um, uh, the assumptions are too great, perhaps, in some cases. And finally, the uh, definitive tome on this matter is Adam Shostak's uh, Threat Modeling, Designing for Security. So how do we get started with this process? Annotating an existing diagram is a good place to start. Equally, having somebody go up to a whiteboard and try and draw this diagram from memory means that we can trace through the process as they think about how the packets are flowing, that gives us an opportunity to start quizzing, asking more questions. Um, often, a security, uh, often an architect's view of a system is not actually what's implemented. So it's uh, a wonderful uh, sort of re-stitching of the, or re-weaving of the tapestry, perhaps. So 
we, we could start from the diagram with the whiteboard. If we have to, we can use Strive or Pasta or any other framework mandated by our organization. But just engaging in the exercise is hugely valuable. It, it's best to avoid getting bogged down in process as with all things. And for each point on the diagram, we immerse ourselves in the data flows. We imagine the network behavior. We think about the code paths that are being executed, the users and robot accounts that are passing through credentials, encryption, privilege, further access, and attempt to model what an attacker would do if they compromise that part of the system. So once we've described these things, we write them up as pros, but as an information format, that can be impenetrable. So we can use a graph to represent the phases of an attack. This is an example of um, the sort of thing that we'd start off with, looking at the trust boundaries of a Kubernetes cluster. And this also helps to inform those discussions when we say, okay, well, um, what about, uh, what happens if, the kubelet or container D or run C is compromised. Well, those three are within the same trust boundary. So essentially, if one goes, they all go. Um, there are There is some nuance here and nothing is ever clean cut, but this really helps to inform discussion. As an aside, we can also use standards like the CIS benchmark to generate a set of controls, but we can never be certain that they are comprehensive for our use case. We may have accrued technical debt, shipping a system on time. There is only one way that we really can gain confidence that we have an attack or attacker's angles covered, and that is to internalize their process and perform as if we were part of the red team. Take that mindset, apply it to the problem, and iterate on it. This is the art of threat modeling. If I can get remote code execution in an application running in your Kubernetes cluster, I will enumerate everything I can find. And that process can be mapped using an attack tree. So Bruce Schneier once said, we are looking to formally and methodically describe the security of our systems from an attacker's perspective. So here is an attack tree. These are typically described using a top-down approach. This is simplified for the point of explanation. The full detail uh, we will get to in later slides. So in this case, we start with the negative outcome that we would like to avoid at the top, malicious code in workload. And subsequently, we ask ourselves, how could we achieve that? This is useful when working with security teams who have already identified a negative outcome that they would like to avoid. We see that there's a legend on the left-hand side. Just to explain that for a moment, the shape and color dictates whether or not this is an and or an or. That is whether the child nodes need to all or partially be realized in order for the the colored node to be exercised. So an AND node requires both actions or conditions joining it to be true, while all nodes indicate that there are multiple ways, as in all of them. So one way to actually get malicious code into an image, according to this attack tree, is to deploy a poisoned container image, which in turn requires that that image is poisoned in the container registry itself. And this could be done through the compromise of a pull secrets, which is incorrectly configured with a push or write privileges. And the image also needs to be deployed to the cluster somehow. And in this case, we're relying upon the standard churn of a uh, release or of uh, auto scaling nodes to pull that image from uh, its location in the registry. Um, we can obtain the image pull secret in multiple ways as well, via the Kubernetes API, by, by exploiting a pod with uh, access to the file system, or by reading the Kubernetes secret from the kubelet itself. In reality, so comparing the top-down approach, attackers are able to gain some level of access and ask themselves, what can I do now? So to model that, we use a bottom-up approach shown here with a simplified tree. 
From a start point such as remote code execution, we ask, what can we do now? This diagram may be slightly hard to read, so let's zoom to the lower half. So, same diagram, the bottom green node, remote code execution in a container. Of course, this is the foothold that an attacker desires in order to begin enumerating and pivoting throughout the infrastructure, escalating privilege, ultimately looking to perhaps install crypto miners, steal secrets, look for um, valuable code perhaps or data. So in this excerpt of the tree, we focus upon how the container service account token, if sufficiently privileged, can be used to start pods, exec to a running container or extract secrets. And for the top half of the diagram, we can now see how this could lead to pushing or pulling images from an image repository, unauthorized access of data, crypto locking, ransomware attacks. So as you can see, the attack tree format itself is not particularly complex, but when composed into a greater diagram, these could be an incredibly useful tool to reason about the security of a system. And once attack trees are created, we can map security controls onto the tree. We tend to create attack trees assuming that there are no, tool, no controls in place already. And once we map the controls onto the tree, we expect to see the number of nodes and branches shrink. Cutting the branches on the tree is our visual representation of the system's security posture. Of course, automating security regression tests is uh, the, the dev portion of the, uh, the DevSecOps moniker, and it is a, is a favorite activity of mine. By extension, we can enable the Security Operations Center to essentially be proactive um, in these cases. So if we have given them all of, our expect, all of our expected routes to compromise for the cluster, that then gives them an opportunity to hone in on signals or alerts that may suggest that this type of attack is underway or has occurred. Um, it aids forensic teams when looking for uh, evidence of a breach and the blue team who are proactively hardening infrastructure. It also gives them an effective test tweet to write against non-production clusters so that they can try to exploit them and see where the controls have prevented the relevant exploits. And of course, we now have uh, a linga franca between security and project teams. So all of the things you have seen so far are open source. And in fact, everything in this presentation has been open sourced. Uh, Jonathan Meadows um, helped us to uh, kickstart and sponsor this work. And it is released as part of the CNCF Financial Services User Group, the links for which um, are on this slide and again later on. So here is a more comprehensive example of an attack tree. Um, we can see here that obviously the level of complexity and depth that we go down to is really dependent upon the importance of the system and the function of the amount of time that we have to attack it and reason about it and, and verify suspicions, um, create proof of concept, exploits, etc. cetera. Uh, here we have one for reading sensitive data. Again, um, while almost invisible at this point, these are all available in the financial services repository. So that's all well and good, I hear you say. But what do we do if we need to see, or we need to have our own threat models, uh, threat models and attack trees but we don't have any Kubernetes expertise. This is what I alluded to at the beginning, highly qualified and experienced security engineers who do not have the relevant cloud native expertise because cloud native is still, although we often forget, a really nascent and emerging technology. So it's still seeing, um, it's still on the upwards adoption curve with uh, some of the more traditional, slower risk averse enterprises. So, these engineers need some way of identifying their personal skills gap and uh, operating with impunity in safe environments. Uh, specifically, 
red and blue teams who are defending and attacking their own infrastructure do not want to be doing that on their own production infrastructure. So what are those teams? The red team attacks the system and the blue team serves as the defense. They are internal teams. And this is Amanda Rousseau from Facebook who leads their red team. Think about them as sparring partners working together to find security holes within a network. So in order to increase the security awareness of individuals looking to understand the security implications in the cloud native space, we have built a lesson-based cloud native security simulator called CubeSim. It is open source. There is a hosted version on the way at CubeSim.io. Um, you are welcome to uh, sign up for the waitlist and ping me if you have uh, a particular use case and would like to provide uh, beta feedback. So what does this do? It demonstrates attack, defense, and remediation principles in a safe space. By that safe space, I mean dedicated accounts not owned by your organization with the relevant limits on. So even if somebody does get into these things, they're completely isolated, billing limits are set very low, and they are configured in such a way that access to the environments requires use of a bastion anyway. These things still don't give sufficient confidence to, uh, to banks and financial services, of course, which is why um, we will also host this externally. So this provisions infrastructure deployment and Kubernetes clusters, it has a scenario runner with 25 challenges, hints, and scoring systems. There is a raw command line experience, although of course individuals are free to use whatever tools they have at their disposal. And the core engine and scenarios are open source for anybody to run their own CTF or upskill themselves at any time. There's a huge range of scenarios and remediations. And these take inspiration from military terminology in homage to the origins of red and blue teaming. So an example, um, Sanger is a fortified military position, I'm reliably informed. In this case, somebody has changed a cluster RBAC and the audit logs show us that the default service account is making requests that it should not do. This of course is a good signal for a security operations center to monitor. As per your organization's policy, the default service account in every namespace should not be able to query the API server and the suspect calls have been traced back to a specific container. We start in the pod and we verify that the attack is possible. Then we examine the permissions bound to the service accounts, remediate the issue and subsequently add a defense in depth approach to ensure that this doesn't happen again. For those of you that would like to try it, this is where everything is hosted. So uh, the open source version should be relatively easy to kickstart. Uh, feedback is welcome at all times, of course. So what are the learning outcomes? We're looking to understand the ways that Kubernetes can possibly be vulnerable and teach users how to exploit and fix everything. That is application workloads, container images, application operating system, dependencies, file system configurations, users, baked in secrets, malicious images, pod specs, privilege and pod security policy configs, environment variables, service accounts, file mounts, run as user, set comp, SE Linux and security modules, the runtimes, Docker, Cryo, CAS containers, Firecracker, privileged workloads, identity, data stores, traffic sniffing, authentication and RBAC, network policy and networking, admission control, encryption across the cluster, etcd, control plane, TLS, local and remote registries, dashboards and APIs, federated identity, control plane configuration, user access, topology, transport TLS, infrastructure cloud and operating system amongst others. And here is that list for posterity. KubeSim is still under active development and starts with an initial list of 25 scenarios and plenty more that are still being worked on. And we happily accept contributions or requests for specific configurations for your organization. And with that, thank you very much. All right, very nice. <laughs> Big round of applause for Andrew. <laughs> there we go. Nailed it. <laughs> well done, sir. Um, we're quite close to the end. I, had, I wanted to see if we could fit one question in 
before Charlotte introduces our next speaker, first of all, you've got to see my new outfit. I've got a gold jacket now. Um, so uh, I suppose a good general one is what's the best place for people to start learning more about this? Um, obviously, apart from your talk, any resources, uh, meetups, conferences you could recommend? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there is a gentleman in London um, uh, called, uh, oh, what's his surname? Fraser, 0x10, a capital one. Um, his surname escapes me in favor of his uh, handle who ran a threat modeling meetup last year. Uh, there was only one of them, but it was absolutely exceptional. Um, so do find that on meetup and uh, prod him gently for a virtual replay, I would say. Um, threat modeling tends to be uh, used as a heavyweight process in large organizations. So for this very lightweight threat modeling, um, that there is also threat spec, which is something else that Fraser has built, which is very good. Um, but really, it's, uh, it, it's something that is still, in my mind, taking hold, if you like. Um, but from, from a professional perspective, I use this as a precursor to every engagement. And I think it really helps to aid the clarity in my mind as to what I'm actually doing. So um, apart from bugging Fraser uh, <laughs> and, and Mr. Shostak's book, uh, his, um, both of them um, have good blogs and Twitter. Uh, and that is about as much as I can think of. <laughs>